If you are lucky enough to own a home or unlucky enough to rent a basement apartment, you may at one point or another have dealt with something called radon, a radioactive gas that seeps up from the ground. If so, then you or an inspector likely placed a small detection device in your basement, which was collected after a few days and sent to a lab for testing. And if the results came back positive, then the problem was likely fixed simply by sealing cracks in the foundation or installing extra ventilation. But what is radon anyway? Where does it come from, and how dangerous is it? Well, grab your Geiger counter as we dive into the fascinating science and history of one of the few radioactive gases that are found in nature. Radon, the topic number 96, sits in the rightmost column of the periodic table, below the noble gases helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. Like the other noble gases, radon is colorless, odorless, tasteless, and chemically inert, rarely forming compounds with other elements. Unlike these gases, however, the large size of radon's nucleus makes it inherently unstable, causing it to undergo radioactive decay in order to reach a lower, more stable energy state. Interestingly, when radon is liquefied or frozen, its radioactivity causes it to glow orange-red via a phenomenon known as radioluminescence. And for more on radioactive substances that like to give off light, please check out our previous video, Does Anything Radioactive Actually Glow Bright Green? The most common and stable isotope of radon is radon-222, which undergoes alpha decay, emitting two protons and two neutrons, aka an alpha particle, to become the isotope polonium-218. This process has a half-life of 3.8 days, meaning that after 3.8 days, half the atoms in a given sample have decayed. While ordinarily such a short half-life would mean there should be no radon left anywhere on Earth, in reality radon is continuously generated via the decay of much longer-lived radioactive elements like uranium and thorium in the Earth's crust. For example, the most common isotope of uranium, uranium-238, decays via alpha radiation to become thorium-234. This isotope then decays via beta radiation, converting one of its neutrons into a proton, a neutrino, and an electron or beta particle to become palladium-234. This undergoes yet another beta decay to become uranium-234, which then undergoes three alpha decays to become thorium-230, radium-226, and finally radon-222. But the sequence known as a decay chain doesn't stop there as radon undergoes a further sequence of eight alpha and beta decays before finally becoming lead 206. And that's, that's a stable, non-reactive isotope. And if all of that just made your eyes glaze over, don't worry, it gets a lot easier from here on in. Radon was simultaneously discovered in 1899 by French physicists and chemists Marie and Pierre Curie and New Zealand-born English physicist Ernest Rutherford, who detected a short-lived radioactive substance emitted by the elements radium and thorium. The following year, Rutherford, along with English chemist Frederick Soddy and German physicist Friedrich Dorn, determined that this radium emanation was actually a brand new element, which Scottish chemist William Ramsey, discoverer of all the other noble gases except helium, initially dubbed Niton from the Latin nitens or shining. Later in 1923, the International Committee for the Chemical Elements gave the gas its current name of radon. Even today, however, some scientists still use the archaic terms thoron and actinon to refer to the less common isotopes radon-220 and radon-219. But even before this new element was fully understood or properly named, it was being vigorously sold to the public as a miraculous health elixir. As covered in our previous video, The Curious Case of the Cure for the Living Dead on our sister channel, Highlight History, check it out. The discovery of radium triggered a worldwide craze for all things radioactive, based on the uh, dubious logic that such a powerful invisible energy source must have rejuvenating health-giving properties. It didn't! Hundreds of companies scrambled to add radium and other radioactive elements to nearly every type of consumer product imaginable, from face creams, toothpaste, and bath salts, as well as bread, condoms, and even soft drinks. Meanwhile, it was discovered that the rocks around certain hot springs, such as at Bad Gastein in the Austrian Alps, were rich in uranium, thorium, and radium, infusing the waters with radon gas. Elaborate spa resorts sprang up around these sites as tourists flocked in the millions to bathe in the supposedly health-giving waters, while the water itself was bottled and sold around the world as a health tonic. Those who couldn't afford to travel to a radium spa could instead buy themselves a so-called emanator, such as the Revigorator, patented by Arizona salesman Ralph W. Thomas in 1912. This consisted of a ceramic crock lined with the uranium ore carnotite, which would infuse water placed within it with radon. According to Thomas's 
advertising literature, more illness is caused by improper water than any other reason and largely because radioactivity is lost from our daily supply of drinking water by the patented composition of highly selected and scientifically compounded radium of which the Revigator is made. This lost element is perpetually restored to all drinking water placed therein. The Revigator is sold as a treatment for all sorts of common ailments from arthritis and flatulence to dementia and impotence. Thomas also patented the Thomas Cone, a smaller, cheaper ceramic emanator that could be placed in a regular water jug. Recent analysis of Revigator jars has revealed that the radiation produced by the radon was only 10 times higher than background levels, making it mostly harmless. Indeed, the heavy metals, arsenic, lead, and vanadium found in the carnonite lining and ceramic glaze likely posed a higher health risk than the radon. Other radioactive products, however, were not so benign. Indeed, by the early 1930s, the radium craze had come to an end, largely thanks to the gruesome and highly publicized death of American golfer, industrialist, and socialite Eben Byers, an avid consumer of Radathor, a radium-infused health tonic sold by Bailey Radium Laboratories of Orange, New Jersey. In 1930, Byers began suffering from chronic fatigue and weight loss, followed by the loss of his hair and teeth. Soon, his body became riddled with multiple tumors, resulting in both his upper and lower jaw having to be removed. After two years of agony, Byers finally died in March of 1932 and was buried in a lead-lined coffin. Radium, used in luminous paint, also poisoned dozens of young women hired to paint glow-in-the-dark watch and clock dials, as covered in our previous video, Glowing in the Dark, the Radium Girls. While millions of people still bathe in radon-infused waters like those at Bad Gastein, indeed, strangely enough, visits to such spas are covered by German and Austrian health insurance, today, most people only encounter this gas when it seeps uninvited into their homes. Ironically, given people's more casual relationship with radioactivity in the past, radon accumulation has actually become worse with time as homes have been built to be increasingly airtight. The degree of radon infiltration depends mostly on local geology, with houses built over uranium and thorium rich minerals like granite being most at risk. Being heavier than air, radon accumulates in low-lying areas like cellars and basements, quickly reaching potentially dangerous concentrations. While the alpha particles emitted by radon are unable to penetrate human skin, the gas is very easily breathed in, placing radon on atoms into intimate contact with lung tissue. This allows the alpha particles to deposit large amounts of energy directly into the cell tissues, causing extensive genetic damage and potentially triggering the formation of cancerous tumors. But just how great is this risk? Well, according to Health Canada, exposure to radon-laced air at levels around 200 becquerels per cubic meter over 70 years increases a non-smoker's risk of developing cancer by 2%. This risk is significantly higher for smokers at 17%. At concentrations of 800 becquerels per cubic meter over the same time period, this risk increases to 5% for non-smokers and 30% for smokers. Indeed, after smoking, radon is the second most common risk factor for lung cancer in North America. It's also a significant health risk for workers in uranium and various other hard rock mines. And for those wondering, a becquerel is a unit of radioactive decay equivalent to one particle delay per second. If radon infiltration is suspected, homeowners are advised to purchase and install a detection kit in the lowest point of their home. There are several types of such kit, with the most common consisting of a small canister filled with an absorbent material like liquid or powdered polyethylene that accumulates ambient radon over several days. The canister is then sent to a lab for testing, where the alpha emissions of the radon are measured to determine the gas concentration. Some variants of these devices include a substance that emits flashes of light or scintillates when struck by alpha particles, allowing the radioactivity to be measured optically. Other types of radon detectors are simply digital radiation meters, allowing radon levels to be monitored continuously in real time. While most radon evaluations take place over only a few days, as radon levels fluctuate naturally due to transient conditions like atmospheric pressure, longer-term measurements are sometimes mandated to determine overall risk. If dangerous levels of radon are detected, a number of steps can be taken to mitigate the risk, such as sealing cracks in the foundation and gaps around pipes and electrical conduits to prevent radon from leaking into the house. Special radon traps can be installed below the foundations and in floor drains, and positive pressure ventilation introduced to vent accumulated radon to the outside. Generally, government guidelines dictate that regular living areas should contain less than 200 becquerels per cubic meter of radon, while most mitigation strategies can successfully reduce radon concentrations down to around 4 becquerels per cubic meter. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, does radon have any practical uses? Well, yes, but mainly as a so-called check source to calibrate radon detection equipment. It is also used as an easily detectable tracer to measure the migration of air and water in mines, buildings, and other environments. 
to these applications, radon is purified by dissolving uranium and thorium ores in acid, removing other gases using heated catalysts, and precipitating out the radon, which liquefies at minus 61.7 degrees Celsius and freezes at minus 71 degrees using liquid nitrogen. However, given its short half-life, radon must be continuously produced in order to keep up with demand. And that, in a nutshell, is the fascinating history and science of radon, a relatively rare element that nonetheless has a significant impact on everyday lives. So if you haven't already, get your house or apartment tested, or your friends may begin to comment on your strangely healthy glow. Ooh.